Hey everyone, welcome to Wildlife Inspired. I'm your host, Scott Keys, and today I'm going to talk about low angle photography with wildlife and why it's so important. And in, I'm going to introduce this topic of perspective because I think it's critical with low angle photography that we understand why perspective is so important. So we'll get into those two concepts right after this. Before we get into the, the uh, discussion today, I do want to point out, I've been doing these featured images. I'll show, I'll put this one up on the screen. This is a cerulean orb I took a couple years ago that I really, really like. And I do have these prints available. I'll put a link at the bottom. Uh, just click on the link. It takes you right to the site where you can look at the inventory that I have on hand. And if you're interested in that one, um, you can check that one out or you can check out some of the other prints that I have down there as well. Let's get into the video though. A few years ago, I did a blog on low angle photography and the importance of perspective. And I wanted to revisit that concept in a YouTube video that's a little bit more educational. So in my videos, I do some live interviews and I do some software reviews and tips, but this one is actually just going to be a, a more of an educational, a little bit of a how-to along with some tips and, tri uh, tips and tricks for low angle photography. And I'm going to actually take you out in the field and I'll show you my setups and what I use. And again, why it's so important. I hope to be able to illustrate some of that as well. So I'm going to show you a couple of diagrams and a couple of examples of low angle photography and why it's so important. But before we get to the low angle stuff, I really need to just explain perspective very quickly. In fact, perspective for me is one of my three fundamentals for bird photography. And here's why. With a lot of t uh, different types of photography, perspective isn't really much of a consideration. So for example, if you're doing architectural wor work or if you're a landscape photographer, or maybe you're doing studio work, and even if you're doing wildlife photography with large game, you're probably at eye level already. So for example, if I'm shooting an elk, that elk probably falls in the same focal plane as my camera would mounted on a tripod or monopod. It's about eye level. So changing my perspective, while I, I'm sure some people would have to change a little bit, isn't a major factor. But with bird photography, it's much different because those birds could be way overhead or could be on the ground. So waterfowl or shorebirds could actually be just inches off the ground. So now perspective becomes really, really, really important. And the first concept around that is engagement. So I want you to just think of somebody who's significantly taller than you and how you feel when you're looking up at that person. And also somebody who's significantly shorter than you and how you feel looking down at that person. You don't always feel connected or engaged with them. So when we're, when we're shooting our subjects or we're taking pictures and we're creating these images, engagement will often be created just by being on the same focal plane or at eye level. So that eye to eye contact is generally more appealing. Now, I'm, I'm just talking about basic portraiture here. I'm not talking about anything that's creative like overheads or things like that. I'm just talking about basic portraiture. So one perspective is used to create engagement. So the second part of perspective though, is how does it handle things like backgrounds? So I want to illustrate this for you. Uh, real quickly before we get out in the field. So right now I'm going to put up a series of images that were taken at different heights off the ground. So basically I just grabbed, here he is. This is my little rooster from the chicken, uh, my little rooster from the kitchen rather. And he's just a few inches tall, probably about the size of a, of a songbird, like a robin. And I put him on the ground and I started to photograph him at standing, so six feet, kneeling about three feet, um, about one foot off the ground. And then I photographed him with the camera almost resting on the ground as low as I could get it. And look at the difference. And I'm going to put all four of these up at the same time so you can see them. Look at the difference, particularly from when it's about a foot off the ground to just a couple inches off the ground. And notice that I see through the subject all the way to the distant background. Now I'm going to put a graph up here. This is something I just made for illustration purposes, but this graph actually shows you now how that angle works. And notice when I'm standing taller that I'm shooting straight down and the background that's created is the grass that's right below the bird. And it's also pretty much in focus. I go back to that first picture and you can see now the grass below the bird is in focus. So it's not real appealing. There's nothing real beautiful about this grass. I go a little lower. And look at this second line now and you can see the grass is a little further behind it's going to be a little more out of focus and go back to that picture when it's about three feet off the ground and you'll see it 
And now let's go to one foot and you'll start to see a difference here because at one foot, the background grass gets a little more out of focus, but notice the focal plane is still on the grass. I, I haven't escaped the grass as my background yet, but now I go down to that, you know, that one or two inches off the ground. And now look at the diagram. You're shooting now straight through the subject and you're missing the grass almost completely. And you might even just get some foreground. Now look at the image that's created again. And notice what the background is. It's no longer grass, it's distant tree line. Now this concept of shooting through the subject is critical for low angle photography. And it's one of the reasons that I stress that you really, in most cases, wanna get as low as possible. Now there may be some circumstances where you want the foreground to be the grass, or in some cases the water, like for example, if it's a reflection shot, you may wanna get a couple inches above the ground or a foot above the ground to get some of that reflection in. But I'm gonna deal with this ultra low angle concept in shooting through. Now, again, before we get out in the field, I wanna show you a couple more examples right here where that concept you could see visually. I'm gonna show it to you here with shorebirds. There's a few right there. And I'm gonna show it to you with some, just some birds that are on the ground, some songbirds that might be foraging on the ground. And notice with these perspectives, I'm shooting through the subject and I'm actually capturing what's behind them. So run out into the field right now and I'll show you some of my setups and then I'll run back to the uh, to desk after this and we'll wrap up. Okay, so here I am. This is kind of a typical setup for ground birds, so song birds, and that's actually, I'm gonna try to shoot some today and see if I can get some. I've got a lot of white-throated sparrows on the edge of my property, so maybe I can get one of them to, to come in close and uh, see if we can grab a picture of that. But this is a typical setup for something like songbirds that I would use that are on the ground foraging. If I was shooting shorebirds, it would be a little bit different. I don't generally use camouflage for shorebirds, but I almost always use some type of camouflage for waterfowl. This is a little, just a homemade netting that I have draped across here with some stakes. Um, so I can go up to the edge and kind of stake this in if I'm shooting waterfowl or at home, I, I'll often use this at home. If I don't have the ability to set this up, I often just have a piece of this loose netting in my car and I'll literally just throw it over the lens and try to get a little bit of it over my head. The key for me is just to cover my face in this. Uh, I'll link this down in the bottom. It's just a, it's kind of like a cape. I use it sometimes, I don't use it all the time, but um, it's always in my car. So if I feel like I need a little more camouflage, I'm not a camouflage freak, so I don't, I'm not out there all the time in camo, but this, this is really, really critical. I always have this for almost any type of uh, low level or ultra low level photography. I'm using some kind of a netting. Um, and then I also have, I'll link this, this is probably the most common, I'm not gonna put it on because I'm making the video, but this is probably the most common piece of uh, camo that, that people use. It's called a blanket throw. You literally just throw it over yourself. It's got a mesh piece here, so you can actually see through it. And then it Velcros up the front. You can put your lens through the Velcro. Uh, so I'm not gonna throw it on today, but this is great, not just with low angle work, but I'm, I actually use this mostly when I'm on the tripod, because it fits right over the tripod. It's made by Lens Coat, very reputable. I've had it for years. Um, and it's done a good job, so I'll link this one for sure. This would probably be something I would recommend for most wildlife photographers, by the way. All right, let me show you the setups that I use. So you can see I've got the netting here. I did a video on this before. This is my paella pod or my ground pod. So you can see this big pan down here. It's just homemade and it's got a gimbal head, but it is a side mount gimbal. I did a video on why I like these. I'll try to link that up in the cards here, but why do I prefer side mount versus these swing arm gimbals? Um, I prefer them for low angle photography for sure. There's a, a couple reasons I won't get into it now, but that this is one of the setups that I use. All right, when whatever I'm using to support this, I always keep this with me. And I'll show you the difference real quickly and why. I'm gonna take this camera off in a second, but I wanna show you one more setup before I do that. So I've got this pillow. Uh, it actually works as a great seat cushion as well. So if you're on rocks or sitting for a long period of time, that could be helpful. And this is one I've been using lately. I'll link this product at the bottom. It's a mini tripod and it's capable of holding um, enough weight that I'm comfortable here. And it's the same, I bought two of these heads. I got a really good price on these, so I actually bought two of them. Uh, it's made by Movo, it's carbon fiber, super light. 
But notice this one sits up taller. And the reason that I like this one is if I'm shooting off a true ground pod, I can't raise it easily. This one I can raise, I can actually make it even taller if I wanted. The legs only extend out about 12 inches, but if I wanna flatten it, so it, it just has more mobility. If I wanna flatten it, see if I can do this with one hand, I can uh, adjust these pins there. And now I've got it totally flat. You can also do this with a full size tripod, but there is one note. You don't wanna have a center column. If you're shooting low angle photography or if you're a wildlife photographer, I don't recommend uh, tripods with a center column because you can't flatten them out like this. If your tripod doesn't have a center column, most of them will allow you to flatten it out all the way. So notice this one now, next to my Paella pod, it's still a little taller, but it's got more flexibility. And, and sometimes where that comes into play is if you're shooting, I'm actually shooting a little uphill right now. This low angle one might be too low. This will allow me to shoot up. I can remember a couple times, I'll show you a picture here. We shot some lease turns years ago and they were um, over a, a berm, like a little dune. And I ended up having to take it off the ground pod and handhold it. And it was kind of an awkward height. Um, and it just was, was annoying. If I had this, I could adjust it to get it a little bit taller. So this one has some good flexibility. Uh, I forget the price on these. It might run about a hundred bucks. I'll put a link down there at the bottom. So anyway, so I've got the mini tripod that I use for low angle photography. I've got the ground pod. This one's homemade. And I've got what I actually shoot the most. When I want to get the ultra low angle, I'll pop these off. Let me get this out of the way. I'll push this out of the way. Most of my low angle photography is right here. Off of uh, just a pillow like that. That allows me to get really, really low. I'm gonna show you a picture of me in the field um, because a lot of times I don't even use the pillow. So my favorite technique, especially for shorebirds, is simply lose everything. I flip this upside down and I'm literally laying this here on the ground with my fingers just under it enough to get a little bit of elevation there. So these are uh, some things you might wanna try. The ground pod's really, really effective. I'll put links to this, this um, gimbal head, this side mount gimbal. Because these aren't my primary setups, I don't like spending a ton of money. I'm very value conscious. So I think I picked these up for about a hundred bucks. You can make the, uh, the pan yourself. So figure about 120, $130 for that. Uh, the pillow is like, I don't know, 10, 20 bucks. So that's a no brainer. And this little tripod guy here, this total setup was probably about $200. The head's about a hundred, the legs are about a hundred. Um, and if you're going with these mini ones and you have heavy equipment, just make sure it's rated to support that much weight. So uh, I'm gonna get set up. Let's see what I can get out here in the field today. Uh, there are some white-throated sparrows back here. So we'll see if I can get lucky with some of those. And I'll just show you some images of other low angle photography I've done over the years um, while we transition. So as a wrap, I hope you found the video helpful and hopefully I provided enough examples in here where you could see the importance sometimes of just what a few inches can make in terms of perspective and engagement, but, but really how it helps you to shoot through a subject and into the background. And I, I hope the, the examples I provided were helpful to you today. Also, hopefully you found some of the tips and tricks helpful. So I'll put some links to some of those things that I used in the video down at the bottom. So feel free to check those out as well. And I do want to thank you for your continued support on the channel. If you're not subscribed to the channel, please do so now. And, and please hit the like button and put some comments down there. I really do like the engagement that's created in the comments. So if you could put some comments down there, are you successful 
in your low angle photography? Or do you think that you could challenge yourself to, um, to explore this a little bit more because it really can be a lot of fun. So thanks for tuning in today. Thanks for your ongoing support. And I hope we can continue to find inspiration in wildlife together.